Hi, um, I'm Derek. Uh, I'm your instructor for the operating systems class. Um, this is part two of the video on short-term process scheduling. Okay, so now we're going to be looking at um, some um, scheduling algorithms that use uh, slightly more complex policies. Okay, so let's start. We'll, we'll start with shortest process next. Um, so, so we're back. This is a, a non-preemptive um, scheduler. Okay, so remember that means that. Um, once we start a process running, um, it's going to run until it's done. So, so we don't make another scheduling decision until the, the process finishes. Okay. So um, this is this is relatively simple. So in both of the, the 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 mechanisms that use queuing, they can be relatively unfair to short processes or I/O bound processes. So so the idea here is okay if if we need something that's that's um, Fair, or that even that has a preference for short processes. Well, let's just look at the the uh, their, the service time and select the one with the shortest um, service time. Okay, so that's really all the decision function does for shortest process next. Um, but notice, I mean, this means that we need to know, or at least be able to estimate the service time of a process. Okay, so one reason why we don't really use this normally um, in in systems like Windows or, or Linux is because it, it, I mean you can kind of uh, we'll show a method of how you might go about estimating um, service times or burst average burst times um, but uh, but you can't really know right you can't really know how long um, a process is going to need to execute before it's finished right or how long it's going to need to execute before it needs to do I/O, so it's finished with its I/O burst. So, so yeah, in batching systems, they used to use shortest process next by just having the programmers who submitting the batch jobs would estimate how, how long the, the 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 job should take, right? So there, you know, if you if the programmer um, substantially overestimated, uh, their they their job might uh, you know their job might not get run. You know, so it would have to wait for all the short jobs to be finished before they would run the long job, okay? So the programmer might like not like that, so, so the, the inclination was for the programmer to underestimate, to, to say that their program would, would go real quickly. But that can cause shortest process next not, not to work if you're, if you're underestimating. So most batching systems would abort a job if it went like, you know, 10% over the estimate or 25% or whatever, the kind of a grace period was for the estimate. So, um, so for the process that we're using um, in these uh, video lectures, um, here's how shortest process next would look for that set of processes in arrival time. Okay, so again, um, um, A arrives at time zero. Um, there's no other process, so by definition, A is the shortest process, so it gets scheduled. And since it's not preemptive, it will run till it's done, okay? Now, at time four, uh, I'm B arrived at time two, and then C arrived at time four, okay? So this isn't really a ready queue anymore, so, so you know, it doesn't matter which process was here first or last. Uh, we're not making our decision based on how long it's been waiting. We're making our decision based on how large the process is. So here, if we look at time four, B has a service time seven, and C has a service time three. So C would get selected to run. Right? So, so C would run until it was finished, since we're non-preemptive, so it would be done at time seven. So while C was running, uh, D and E arrive. So D arrives at time five, and E arrives at seven. So now when C is done, we've got B, D, and E. And again, we would select the shortest process, which is D. Um, so D would run until time nine. So so B and E then at time nine B and E are still on the queue um, and F arrives at time nine. So we've got those three processes um, to select among to make our decision and and F that just arrived with the show. So notice that this this very muchly illustrates how short processes jump immediately to the front of the queue. Okay, or another way you can think about shortest process next is that we use a priority queue based on service time. So, so if I was to reorganize this where we put the, the one with the smallest service time at the front of the queue, 
um, then we could just select the thing at the at, at the head of the queue based on service time as you know so minimal service time has highest priority so, so that's D um, so it, oh, at, at time nine um, so D was done so then we still have BEF so then from there we're just selecting the smallest process so F would go then E then B to finish out there um, so I, I, I just quickly kind of want to to say how you might use shortest process next um, or shortest remaining time that we'll talk about next year, how you might use that in a real system where you don't know. So like in a real system, you've got processes. So what you want to estimate is not the, the service time, but you want to estimate how long the next burst is going to last. So how long, if I schedule the process, how long is it going to be till it needs to... Uh, do some more I/O again, okay? So if you knew that, you could differentiate between things that that are processor bound, so that have long average times between uh, their I/O bursts, and things that are I/O bound that have small times between their bursts, okay? So so if you think about that, if you just keep an average, so so basically, if you just for every process that's running, you just keep track of 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 the execution time, the the burst time. So here, you know, if the process has been running for 10 time steps, or, or um, not time steps, but if it was scheduled 10 times, you just keep track of how long it ran until um, it had I.O. Um, um, and then you just, you know, average those together. And that would give you kind of an estimate for what the next burst time, probably a pretty good estimate of, of what the, the next burst time is likely to be, all right? So, and and uh, you can you can do this as a summing, if, um so if you just rewrite this a little bit, you don't have to keep summing up all the past history. You can just take the next one. So this really comes down to like using a weighted sum or a weighted average. Um, so using this formulation, uh, you can you can calculate what the next um, um, estimated service time is going to be by just adding in the the, the weighted. Of, of the the last service time that we said in order to update the next uh, average service time all right uh, and then if you change that so if, if you use an unequal weighting you can get what's known as exponential averaging and I'll show you real quickly why you might want to do that so um, basically you know so, so here if, if 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 like if n is 10 I'm going to use one tenth of my weight for the most recent and nine tenths of the weight will be for the the previous nine in order to come up with my next estimate. But I could use something bigger than one tenth, you know. So I could use an alpha of 0.5 or even 0.9. So in that case, whatever my I'm going to be more responsive to my last burst time in in, in terms of estimating my next burst time. Um, and that's all this slide or figure 9.8 from our textbook is is trying to illustrate is that if the higher the alpha is for an exponential averaging. Uh, the, the more weight you're giving to recent observations in terms of estimating your next observation, okay? But th this is probably more important. So, so re the reason why you use exponential averaging is, uh, let's say this is, this is what your actual burst times look like. So I have a process, so, so the square blocks are the observed values. I have a process whose burst times are increasing, right? So, uh, so, so it, it only took one time step between I/O the first time it ran, but then it took two, and then three, and then four. Okay, All right? So if you if you just take a simple average, um, you get the the square here. So so once by the time you get to here, we're lagging quite a bit. So our estimate of what the next burst time is likely to be is five, when, when our burst times are more like ten here. So, so that's why you usually want to use some sort of exponential averaging because you want to be more responsive than 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 using a simple average. So, if if we use a higher weight on more recent observations, we will more quickly follow changes um, in kind of the average burst time. Right. Same thing if if the if the burst time was decreasing instead of increasing. So, you know, a simple average can be bad. But, of course, may, you don't want your alpha to be too high because then it would be too responsive. So, so there's going to usually be some sweet spot. So, again, the, 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 you're mostly only using the past four or five uh, values in your average um, 
um, to estimate your next I/O burst time. So. Um, okay, so back to our schedulers. So the next one we'll talk about is shortest remaining time. So this is really the same as shortest process next. It's just a preemptive version of shortest remaining time. Okay. So, um, but we're going to be doing preemption differently than what than what we did um, in the previous lecture video with round robin. So here, I mean, you can come up with different uh, ways to, to implement preemption or, or different uh, mechanisms to decide when to preempt. So here, for short remain time, we preempt only on new process arrival. So instead of like a timeout or a quantum, uh, we, we just, every time a new process arrives, we just, we, we make a new scheduling decision, okay? We do that because uh, because if a short process arrives, we might want to preempt the law the the current running process if it's a long process, uh, and let that short process run to get it out of the system, and then then we can go back to to executing the long process. All right. So um, so yeah, short process jump right to the queue with this. Uh, so again, both SPN and SRT favor short processes, and this even more favor short processes because, you know, again, without preemption, it could happen that, that a short process arrives right after a long process starts running. So in that case, the short process ends up having to wait a long time anyway. So this gives really superior performance for short processes by having, by preempting when short processes arrive. But um, now we have a big risk of starvation for longer processes. So if you have a steady stream of, of short processes being created or arriving in your system, the, the long processes might never get to run, right? So that can be a danger. So you might have to balance out the other way now, you know, do something to try and make certain that long processes or processor bound processes don't get starved of CPU. So, um, so let's look at SRT real quickly. Um, so A arrives at time two. Um, and it gets scheduled, but at time, or sorry, it arrives at zero, and it gets scheduled and it starts running. At time two, B arrives, so we're going to preempt, okay? So at time two, when, when we preempt, uh, we've, we've got A in the system, but it has a, a, a service time remaining of two out of its four. So again, you, you select not on the service time, you select on the remaining service time. Um, so thus the name, shortest remaining time. Um, but in, in B has a remaining time of seven. So so we, we just so B continues running basically at that point, right? So then at time four, um, C arrives, right? So and, and 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 so we would have preempted, but but A was finished anyway. So so A exits the system. So now uh, C has the shortest remaining time, so we would schedule C to run. Uh, but um, at time five. Um, um, D, D arrived, okay? So uh, we kind of have, I mean, you know, at, at that point, when, when at time five, when D, arrives, D arrived, it has the service time, remaining time of two. Um, C ran once, so it, it has a remaining time of two also. And B still has a remaining time of seven, okay? So we have a tie here. Um, so whenever you have a tie, you have to have like a secondary mechanism to decide. So a good tiebreaker is to, if, if you have a, a tie, to, to select the process, to let the process that was running keep running. Or another one, another way to think about that is to let the process that, that arrived first uh, to, to start running. Okay, so, which should give you the same decision. I think so. So anyway, so here we allowed C to keep running. Um, so C ran till time seven. So at that point, it would have been preempted, but it was done. Um, so at time seven, though, we still got B and D, and E arrived. So we will select D. It has shortest remaining time to run, and it runs till time nine. Um, and at this point, no more processes are running, so I can't show really any more examples of preemption since nothing arrives after time nine. So so at time nine, basically, it's going to end up with shortest process next. Um, so, so we select F, then E, then B um, to run. So. Um, so another variation, so, so again, since shortest process next and shortest remaining time can be unfair for 
for long processes or, or CPU bound processes, uh, an idea is that, well, if, if we're trying to, if what it is we're trying to maximize that turnaround ratio, let's just directly use that measure as our selection criteria, okay? So, so basically having small response ratios is good, so we want to try to minimize response ratios. So the way to minimize response ratios is if you look at the, the processes that are available to be picked, you want to pick the one with the highest ratio because it, if, if you start running it, it'll stop waiting, and that will start reducing its ratio, okay? Does that make sense? So, so yeah, the reason why you pick the highest response ratio is because you want to minimize. So you want to make those response ratios smaller because, because small response ratios is, is an indication of better performance of your scheduler here, right? So the book only, uh, you could actually have a, a, a preemptive version of HRRN just like shortest process next, shortest remaining time are uh, non-preemptive and preemptive. The book only shows uh, a non-preemptive version, um, and I'm only going to go through a non-preemptive version as well, but you could do the same thing. So you could preempt on process arrival and recalculate the response ratios. Um, so. So let's look at how this works. So for the non-preemptive version, again, uh, you know, the process will never be interrupted. So once we start a process, it'll run until it finishes. All right. So A, um, when it arrives at time zero, um, there's no other process, so it's going to have the, the, the highest response ratio. So we select A. Um, and also at time four, well, at time four, uh, B arrived at two, but C uh, arrived at four. Um, so we, we do have our first decision. So to calculate the response ratio of these, uh, B has been waiting for two time steps. So you take the wait time plus the service time divided by the total service time gives us the, re the response ratio. So that's what we mean by the, the ratio of um, TR divided by the service time, right? TR is really just the sum of the wait time plus the, the service time. So, so anyway, that gives us 9 sevenths or 1.28 as our res response ratio for B, and, and C hasn't been waiting at all, so it has a response ratio. Well, you can never have a, a lower response ratio than one, you know, because you're adding in the wait time, and, and the wait time can only be zero at a minimum, right? So, so B is going to have a higher response ratio, so we'll run it, right? So while B was running, um, you know, it runs from 4 to 11, and the rest of the processes arrive. So at time C, we have to calculate the response ratios for C, D, E, and F. Right. So at time 11, C has been waiting since 4, so it's been waiting for 7, um, so it has a response ratio of 3.33. D has, has been waiting for 6, um, so it, you know, it arrived at time 5, um, uh, the, the, the next time step after C, um, and so on. So, so maybe I won't, you know go through all these. But yeah, if you calculate those out, notice D ends up with the highest response ratio, right? So notice, and the thing to notice is that it ended up picking the smallest process in this case because small processes, so, so even though C has been waiting longer, it's a, it's a longer process. So, so small processes are more affected in their response ratio by having to wait a long time. So that, that tipped the favor uh, for D here. So it got selected. Um, and then, yeah, at time 13, when D is done, we recalculate the ratios, um, you know, so you come up with this, so, so C's been waiting for 9, E for 6, and, and F for 4, that gives us these ratios, and we select C to run, right? Um, and then at time 16, when C finishes, um, we've got the ratios, uh, here, so, so, um, so here, E just slightly um, tipped out F for, for the ratio, it has a slightly higher ratio. So we select E to run even though F was smaller um, and arrived after it. So, and then we know that F runs. So. Um, okay, so the last um, scheduling algorithm I'm going to look back, look talk about is the feedback scheduler. Um, I should have added this on my slides because actually one thing I do want you to know is that the feedback scheduler is basically the the, the scheduler that you see in most real operating systems because the, uh, the feedback scheduler is a type of um, uh, 
pri priority-based scheduler, okay? And most um, operating systems use some sort of priority mechanism, priority-based mechanism. So in this case, and, and most operating systems use a priority-based mechanism that works similarly to the feedback scheduler. So it's, it's priority combined with um, the age of the process to, to dynamically change the priority. So, so that's how like Windows and Linux, actual, their schedule actually works, using a combination of priority and um, how long the, the processes have been running and how long they've been waiting. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the feedback scheduler, um, um, so we don't, in this version, we don't actually use explicit priorities. So we have an implied priority by keeping track of processes and putting them on different queues. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a second, okay? But the, the, the way that we calculate the priority or the age of a process uh, is, a, is a proxy method, uh, a proxy way of being able to estimate whether a process is a long process or a short process, okay? So again, I mean, we can't know really ahead of time what the next service time or the next burst time is going to be, but we can we can estimate it, um, and we and we don't have to estimate it by explicitly calculating it like we did with exponential averaging. We can estimate it uh, with mechanisms like this by by keeping track of of, of some proxy of of um, how long it's been executing. Okay. Um, So yeah, the, pre the feedback scheduler is a preemptive scheduler with, with, with a dynamic priority mechanism. Um, so the, basically the way this works, we're going to have multiple queues, and processes enter at the highest priority level, so they get put onto the queue that has the highest priority first, but then every time they get preempted, we reduce its priority and move it down to the next uh, level priority queue, all right? And you'll see how that works in the next slide here, so... Um, some some attributes of the feedback scheduler. Um, so, like I already discussed, um, so so using service time directly is not feasible for many systems. So that's a that's re that's a reason why most real schedulers are some form of feedback or priority based schedulers. Okay. Um, and yeah, I think I already did discuss these. You know, so so it, so it, it, its real advantage is that these these feedback priorities are are a proxy measure of of, est of, of an estimate of the service time of the process. So. Feedback schedulers in their pure form can be um, disadvantageous for um, long processes, but it's pretty easy to counteract that by uh, having some sort of de-aging mechanisms. So if a process has been waiting too long, then, it, then its priority starts ri 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 rising again instead of lowering. So. So that'll counteract it, um, um, having a low priority or, or being a long process. So, so um, the, the feedback scheduler in its purest form looks something like this. So we have, have different priority queues in levels of priority queues, 0, 1, 2. So let's, let's say you have five priority levels. So in that case, we would have priority queues 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 for five levels, okay? Here, the, the, the textbook is using zero for highest priority, which, which might be backwards from the way you think about it, but a lot of systems use that, so, so the lowest priority number is, is actually the highest priority. But some systems do it the other way, so, so in that case, uh, if we had five priority levels, we might call uh, ready Q5, you know, priority five is the highest priority, and we would label this as ready Q5, and then four for the next highest, and so on, down to ready Q1 for the lowest priority, right? So that, that's just a convention kind of thing. So, um, so let, let's let's walk through the feedback scheduler. Okay, so I'm going to show it with a um, a time slice quantum of one. I, I should have put that up here. So so here, uh, oh, and, and and I should have mentioned that as well. So we we are also using time slices. So so the feedback scheduler is preemptive. We did say that, but the, the way it's preemptive is, again, we're using a time slice quantum like we do for the round robin scheduler, okay? So here I'm using a time slice quantum of um, one, all right? Uh, the minimum time slice quantum, okay? 
So, you know, when, when A arrives, um, it will be put on to ready queue zero at time zero. Then it will be scheduled for one time slice quantum. And then it will be put on to ready queue one. Um, and since there's nothing on ready queue zero, uh, we, we then, the, the, the scheduler goes to ready queue one and, and it finds A then at that point and schedules A to run again, okay? So then at time two, um, um, A is preempted because it ran, it, it um, finished off its time slash quantum. Uh, so since it was at ready Q1 last time, when it gets preempted, it gets up returned to ready Q2. Okay, so that's why my first time step I'm showing here is at time two. So at that point, Q had run, uh, A had run twice, so it had worked its way through uh, priority, priority level zero and one and ended up on ready Q2, and B arrived at time two. Um, so when you new, newly arrived, you start with the highest priority, which is zero, um, in the way we're using it right now, all right? So at time two, given the snapshot, so if I gave you a snapshot on a test and asked, it asked you, so instead of starting from the beginning, if I just gave you like a snapshot and say, continue the simulation from that part, if you had a feedback scheduler like this, uh, you can see, well, you know, my hot, the, 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 the process is in the highest priority queue is here at, at Q0. So I'm going to schedule B to run for one time step, all right? So that leads us to time step three, okay? So at time step three, B gets preempted and gets returned back to priority level one, okay? So again, when we run our schedule, there, there's nothing at priority level zero. So, so then we go to priority level one and B gets scheduled again to run uh, at time three. So now at time four, um, C arrives, so it, it gets put in the system at priority level zero, and B is preempted, um, so it gets preempted and put uh, uh, down to priority level two. And, and notice, again, these are queues again uh, now, so, so the front of the queue, A is at the front of the queue um, at priority level two, and B is at the, the, the tail of the queue at priority level two here, all right? Um, so anyway, that, that's time four. Um, so, so C is going to get scheduled to run for one time slice quantum till time five. So now at time five, uh, C gets preempted, gets returned to prior level one queue. D arrives at time five and gets put onto the prior level zero queue. So we're going to schedule, um, D to run at time five here, okay? I should have pointed out, I'm also keeping track of the remaining time for each of these processes when it runs. So, so, so A ran twice, so it has four remaining. B ran twice, so it has five remaining. C ran once, so it has one remaining. So now at time five, we'll schedule D. So at time six, nothing arrives, um, and D gets preempted, and it gets put to the end of ready priority level one. So now we will schedule C to run. So since C is at the front of the, so there's nothing at prior level zero, um, and so the first process at prior level one is C. So we schedule C until time seven. Um, so now at time seven, C preempts uh, and, and goes down to prior level two, into the prior level two queue, and E arrives. So we're gonna schedule E to run for one time step. So notice, um, um, because we're preempting um, at time slash quantum of one, uh, every time a new process arrives, it runs immediately, right? So anyway, so E runs um, at time seven. Uh, so at time eight, nothing arrives, um, and E goes down to prior level one. So now we're going to schedule D to run um, off of prior level one, front of the prior level one queue here. Time nine, um, F is arriving at time nine, um, and um, um, uh, oh, D, uh, the D was finished. So, so again, you have to keep track of these. So, so when we scheduled D at time eight, um, it, it finished actually now at time nine. So it, it didn't. Um, sorry. So it exited exited the system, right? So that's why it's gone at time nine here. So there's just a lot of bookkeeping, especially when you have small time quantums, when you're trying to simulate these by hand here. So, so F arrives, so uh, time nine, so it's going to run for its first time slice quantum. 
we have no more arrivals at this point, so I can stop checking the arrivals here. Um, so at time 10, uh, E is at the front of prior level 1, so E runs, uh, and then at 11, F runs for 1. And now at this point, um, I think I stopped stepping one by one, because at time 12, you can see um, we're going to have a sequence where A, B, C, F runs. Okay, So at time 12, A, B, C, uh, E, F run in that sequence. C finishes off, okay? So, so A, B, C, E, F run, C exits the system because it only had one time step. Um, so, oh, I forgot to, uh, so now we're at time 17. Sorry about that, there's a mistake on the slide. So now at time 17, uh, we've got A, B, and E, F down at priority level three. Uh, but, but yeah, so, so again, at time 17, A, B, E, and F are gonna run, and A and F are gonna exit the system at this point, right? Um, and yeah, I don't show any more time levels. So you know, if we had another priority level, then for um, at time um, 21, we would have uh, three left of B and one left of E, and they would be at prior level Q. So then at time 21, B and E runs, and E exits the system at that point, and then B just finishes off. All right. So yeah, that's our feedback scheduler. Um, so. A variation of the feedback scheduler, so I already mentioned that, that the feedback scheduler can be unfair, it can even starve large processes. So again, if I have a lots of small processes entering the system, uh, these large processes, there, there might not never be, uh, have the, the, the higher priority queues cleared off so we can run processes that, that work their way down to the low priorities, right? So, so I could start de-aging these and, and increasing their priority. Uh, the, the book offers another mechanism to, to make it a little bit fairer to lower priority processes. We can give them a larger time slice quantum. So in this case, um, um, if I'm at priority level zero, I get a time slice quantum of two to the power of zero. So I, I just get a time slice quantum of one. But if I get scheduled from priority level one, I get two time slice quantum. So so two to the power of one. And, and if, I, if I have a priority of two, then I get a schedule of four time slice quantums. And if I have a prior level three, I get eight. All right, so that, that's kind of the way it works here. So I'm not going to work through this step by step. Again, I'll leave this as an exercise for you to um, um, to verify that this is correct. But this is what you get if I didn't make a mistake um, for our problem with a a variable sized time slice quantum for the feedback scheduler. So notice A gets scheduled for one time slice quantum, uh, and then um, it's at prior level one. So it gets scheduled for two time slice quantum. So that's why it B doesn't execute at time two like it did previously, because it got scheduled for two time slice quantums, um, and then it got returned to priority level three, at which point then we schedule B for a, a single time slice quantum. All right. Um, okay. So that's it for um, our discussion of the um, schedulers here. Um, kind of in quick summary, um, you know, so, so I, I, I hope that you need to understand kind of what the selection mechanisms were for these different process schedulers for the test for the unit this week. Um, you, ought to, you need to remember which ones are non-preemptive and which ones are preemptive. Uh, you need to be able to simulate these by hand if I give you like a set of processes and their arrival times and that type of thing, okay? Um, all right, so I hope that was useful um, to help you understand how the, the short-term scheduling works in an operating system, and um, I will end the video here, and I will see you then in the next video.